Thanks, Coach. That was some great information. I'm going to speak to terminology in regards to positions on the court and also just in general. A lot of times you'll hear coaches say, throw out a term, and it needs to be clear amongst your team that everyone knows what that means. Different coaches have different terminology. Some people always use the word pick, and other coaches use the word screen. Low posts, sometimes referred to as low blocks. You have positions of short corner, corner, wing, point, um, elbow is the term, terminology used. And it's just really important to get on the same page, whether you use different words or not in the uh, lower levels in your freshman and JV programs that you're on the same page and at least know exactly what coaches are referring to and your players understand uh, the terminology that you're using. So from the get-go it's important to me to make sure the players understand the terms that I use. Top of the key, that's an easy one, but not for everyone. Sometimes they don't know what that phrase means, key. Um, in this area at the top of the key between the free throw line. I call that the pocket. All right, That's a phrase not all coaches use. I, I use it as get in the pocket where that's clearly above the free throw line that you're not getting called for a three point or sorry excuse me a three second violation. Other areas that I'm going to talk about today are in terms of what I call pats. P-A-T-S. Anything good, bad, or ugly can be attributed to these four things. Positioning, angles, timing, and spacing. I will go through the different areas on the floor and speak to the re regards of what each of those mean. Positioning. Positioning offensively and defensively. Where your stance is. Are you ready to catch the ball? Things, things like that with positioning. Angles. Are you taking the right angle on defense to cut off a dribble? Angles in passing. Offense and defense, each of these four categories. Positioning, angles, timing, and spacing. I call it pats. Sometimes I refer to it as spat because I feel that spacing is the most important issue. But positioning, angles, and timing, offense and defensively, those four things, anything good, bad, or ugly, you could point to one of those four things. Positioning, rebounding, getting yourself in position to get a rebound, putting yourself in position to get an offensive rebound. Angles, what angle do you take when you charge the basket? The timing on when you jump up to rebound. The timing on the pass, coming down the floor. Angles, when you cut into the basket. Spacing on the floor, initiating, spreading out the defense. Spacing defensively, making sure that you're in a help position. Now, positioning and spacing work together and timing and angles work together. So what I'm referencing to this is both on offense and defense. So within the spacing of an offense, your positioning is important as to where you're gonna go next, movement without the ball. Spacing on defense, same thing. Whether you're in a position to help, whether you're in a position to rebound, and the spacing, that you have to maintain between the ball and your opponent. Whether you're in a man-to-man -man or a zone, spacing and positioning work together um, to provide results that end up good, bad, or ugly. In terms of timing and angles, a lot of that on the offensive side would be in an area of maybe a fast break, you're dribbling down the court, the timing and the angles that you choose and make for a pass that leads to a basket, also the timing and angles that you take on defense to cut off dribble penetration, or the timing used to go up for a rebound. 
These four things are very important. I speak to them often throughout my practices so that kids can understand better when they are in a position where they're not properly spaced, when they're making poor decisions on their timing or the angles that they choose. And a lot of this is based on effort. Effort and attitude are also two areas where you will see players decline or improve. So that you can improve in those areas of positioning, angles, timing, and spacing. Individually, you can do that. But when you visualize where your teammates might be or defenders might be, you can also apply that to a team concept, even individually. So I'm going to go through some movements and show how kids can work on by themselves. Okay, a lot of times you hear and see these clinics and you might say, oh, I know that, I know that. But it helps to reinforce and remember. And it only takes one little moment of getting your creativity where you can springboard and take something to the next level or a little further. A lot of times in my drills to incorporate that spacing and that timing and those angles and positioning, I'll add elements to a basic drill. Even if it's a layup drill, I might sometimes include where the person gets the rebound, steps out of bounds to throw a long inbound pass to start a sideline break. Or I'll add a different pass angle that gets to the next line. Little things like that can make the difference. I love the John Wooden, Wooden quotes, all right? One of which is, um, big things are accomplished by the perfection of minor details, all right? That's, that's one I, I point to a lot throughout the season, along with, it's amazing what gets accomplished when no one is concerned about who gets the credit. A lot of times the difference in a season can simply be the chemistry of the players. You might have the skills within the players, but if you don't have that chemistry to do what it takes to win collectively, you can have some seasons that aren't as successful as other seasons with maybe even less skilled players, but you have that bond of players and you have that locker room that can contribute to a winning season. So, some of these things that I'm going to demonstrate are things that I did as a younger player, okay? Granted, 35 years and 35 pounds ago, I was a lot quicker than I am today. And I definitely subscribe to that. My mind writes checks that my body can't cash. So, it's taken a couple of years for me to accept that I've fully lost a step of quickness when I start to compete and go up against my current players. So one area to, to improve quickly is to focus on your pivot foot. So when you take the ball out of the hoop to throw the ball out to yourself and gather it and work on the pivot foots, there's basically two for each foot. So you have a forward pivot and you can just think of that as moving forward so you catch the ball and you're going forward okay reverse pivot rear pivot it's as simple as saying your rear goes first so on reverse pivot here reverse pivot okay you can use that to seal a defender so if you catch the ball and you feel the defender on one side to pin him in towards the lane, okay, take your layup this way with a reverse pivot, all right? Forward pivot, you're less likely to have the ball stripped, all right? And then you go into things like, like rip throughs. There's so many things that I, I might forget to talk about that coaches will say, oh, you forgot this, you forgot that. So hopefully some of these other presentations that you'll see will fill in those gaps. But remember, sometimes the terminology is not always the same, all right? So one of those areas very easy is just to throw the ball out. I always suggest, like when my kids catch the ball on a jump stop. Why is that? Very simply, if you catch the ball on a jump stop, 
either foot can become your pivot foot. And you have a huge advantage that way because the defender has a lot more room to cover when you can pick up this foot and go this way, right? Or you can pick up this foot and go that way. Whereas if you catch and you already established your pivot foot, that defender can then dictate and tell you where he wants you to go by overplaying one side or the other. And again, that's positioning within the spacing for angles and timing. When you cut someone off, off the dribble, or how you position yourself to make a pass to your teammate. Again, you as a coach, other coaches might explain that differently. It's just being on the same page for grasping the concept of what is trying to be put forward in that. Right, so you get the ball out of the rim, throw the ball out, jump stop, two feet, pivot one way or the other. Taking it to the next level is catching it and getting in a position where you gain the advantage against the defender. So a lot of times, simply that means a step back, if you will. So I can catch the ball there, but I'm going to pivot and end up over there to attack the rim to the left side. So the way that looks like is I go out, I reach it, and then I have that action. May or may not be a trap, but let's be honest. <laughs> In high school basketball, I think the goal is to closer, to more closely represent and be reflective of maybe the college game than the NBA, just on a pure entertainment value and the one-on-one. -on -one. one of my pet peeves is the the carry, and you got the euro step now, and you got the, the the step backs where it's very hard to discern the travel call and they travel so and they don't get called but in high school it gets called a lot of times i'll use terminology that might not be the same i also might forget little minor details that are actually huge details so remember the perfection of minor details is what creates big results right so one of those is that I hadn't really gone over rip through when you bring the ball. You don't want to catch the ball just right in the bread basket here, as they say, and put it for a defender to, to strip the ball. So on that, on that pivot, you might, you might rip through and ideally low, because it's harder for a defender to reach down like that than it is to go up or across, all right? And everything I talk about, as coaches know, the frustrating part is to just focus on, on one thing because there's so much more that goes into something. So when you talk about rip-throughs offensively, then you want to also balance that out. And from a defensive aspect, put yourself in a position. The biggest thing you hear is hands up, hands out, hands wide, you know, not, not reaching, all that stuff. So a lot of times, with these presentations, there'll be gaps that are missed. So hopefully these other presentations that we're putting together will, will fill some of those gaps. So individual improvement, reflective of a team setting, that visualization of a defender of where your teammates might be when you work out by yourself. You take a shot, throw the ball out, with a backspin, or maybe even down on the ground where you practice jump stopping over the ball. You want to pop, protect it, usually, you know, chin it. You hear that on the reboundings, chin it. Again, a lot of different terminology that's thrown around. And that's why I enjoy watching all these different coaches explain how they do drills and team concepts and plays, whatever it might be and you just pick up and gain so much knowledge. But it's also good to just do a few things really well. So back to the individual play of pivots. Here, forward pivot, protecting the ball. 
reverse pivots are usually when you want to rip through because you're really coming, you're really coming into the, the fender this way. So then that's where it's really important to rip through low. And then you get into jab steps, all right? You have jab short, jab long, all right? If you jab short and the, the fender doesn't move, then you jab long and put the ball out in front. So that, that's an angle and space. A lot of times kids just dribble right, right at their body and they're not gaining an advantage and the defender can stay right with them. So practice these things on your own to get better. Think about it, concentrate, do things differently. Don't get caught in the routine of doing the same thing. Talk about creating good habits and not maintaining or keeping bad habits. All right, so on the rip through, then you can have jab step short, jab step long, get the ball out in front, and then you're going into different dribbling moves there. You either continue, you can push the ball out in front to come to a jump stop for a shot, and you got finishes at the basket, you got pivots to the basket, all right? So if the basket is Right here, for example, since I'm not at the basket right now for the camera position, right? You can leave this foot here. So if you have a defender with you, that you're, you're dragging a defender with you, you can leave your pivot foot here, and then turn and spin at the shot this way. Or if you have that defender, you turn, spin. Often working on your pivot foots and your jab steps to get defenders off you, to create a shot, to create a better passing angle. These are improvements that I think can easily be made from year to year and even throughout the season so that kids understand the little subtle differences of what it takes to get better individually and to help your team. So you hear the triple threat position used to always be referred to, and sometimes in order can make a difference, okay? You can pass, you can dribble, you can shoot. Nowadays, it's a, the first one is catch, look for your shot. If you don't have your shot, look for a pass. If you can't do that, then dribble to create your angle. But it's very frustrating to me, anyway, when kids catch and the first thing they do is dribble. Sometimes, yeah, catch, and it's leading you to attack, to the basket, to the pass, but just to catch and dribble to survey is very frustrating. If you're going to catch, look at the basket, you know, you got that shot, all right, unless it's a play that's designed to catch and lead to the next pass that leads to a basket or something to that effect, all right, so that triple threat position I think to use your dribble last as an option is best, especially in a zone situation where the defense is mostly focused on, on the ball and then again defensively your swivel head where guys you, you want to be in a position where you don't get face cut, all right? So a guy come, comes in slides from the, from the block to the elbow without getting bumped or positioned out of the way. So back to individual improvement on these things just from shooting and dribbling and, and pivot step. So you can also adjust where you're going to end up, but this is a little tricky in some regards because another area of frustration is when kids do what, coaches? When they go to receive a pass. That leads to a turnover. They do not meet the ball. So a lot of times it's very frustrating. They don't recognize the swivel head works both on offense and defense. It's mostly in defense that it's spoken to, but on offense, you need to be aware of the smart defender. Okay, the defender that's leading you into a turnover making it seem that he's not paying attention, whatever it might be, and then shoots the gap to uh, steal the ball. So coming through and, and meeting the pass, very important. If you drift away, okay, this isn't like football where you're, you know, you're letting the, 
the ball leads you to a touchdown pass. Sometimes that might be the case in a breakaway layup, but when you're in a half-court set, or even in a full-court set, as an offensive player within the spacing and the positioning, you need to be aware of defenders that are smart, that know how to use angles and the timing to steal passes, shoot gaps, and, and you know, try to minimize turnovers, all right? Rebounding wins games. Turnovers, heavy contributor. If you look in box scores, I tell the kids all the time, look at the difference in rebounds and turnovers. You win rebounding and you win, and you have fewer turnovers, it's close to 100% of wins, or you will certainly be in the mix to win the game in the last minute if you won those two areas. So, throwing the ball out to yourself, a lot of times being passed, and then you can drag your foot, you can still meet your pass, but depending on, on where you put your foot that you want to pivot with can determine where you're going to end up. So there's a lot of coordination and decision making and the focus needs to be on improving, doing things differently. If you just come out here and you do this and you get your shots, you're not going to improve much. You're just, you're just not. So you have to be willing to work and do things, get out of your comfort zone, learn to use either foot as your pivot foot. Remember, you still want to meet the ball. Because if you're not paying attention, the smart defenders are going to come in, take advantage of their knowledge of timing and angles to steal the ball. So you can't pull back as the ball is coming in when you got defenders there. So what? you still have to go meet the ball through. But as you do that, you can leave your pivot foot back, all right? Or know where you're going to step to as you catch it. So from this catch, where I talked about pivot forward, rip through, in just this little area, you can get to a different area to create a better angle of attack or to the next pass within that positioning. All right, so it might look something like this. From here, way over here, just like that to create that advantage. Versus just here in the same simple area. All right, that's a basic thing to make sure kids grasp. And then it becomes the level of their understanding and willing to commit and get out of their comfort zone to change up where they go. And be able to use both the right foot and the left foot as, as you pivot. So that you don't become predictable, all right? Sometimes in high school level, you may not get to the point where you can recognize the predictability of a player. But those student athletes that are fortunate enough to go to the next level, there's a leveling out of the playing field, and some of that is because the scouting is taken up to another level because you have more coaches to be able to analyze film and study players, right? And you can pick up on tendencies. Some players catch it down low, and they will always pump fake before they go up for a shot. All right, things like that. Some kids are predictable on their takes to the basket. They have a move that they want to do to finish. You need to be able to counter. And you can do that with your pivot foot and your ability to change your pivot foot to create better angles, to make a move to the basket. Again, same thing defensively. You can do that with how you position yourself, and dictate and you can tell the offensive player, look, your first dribble is going to be that direction. All right? And you try not to get faked out. But as I said earlier, sometimes it's hard to just focus on one thing offensively because I want to bounce around and make sure that the defensive side of the ball is spoken to as well. And that's probably the hardest thing early on in the season is to just get those things down where you're not forgetting different things that you want to cover or at least for myself as a coach anyway 
I, I just have so much information I want to convey to the student athletes, to the players, um, that I don't want to forget anything. And, and sometimes I just have to remind myself that I need to really break things down one thing at a time, really focus on doing a few things well, and, and at least first, before you build up to uh, more difficult things, if you will. Lay those foundations first. A lot of times it's in that terminology, so when I'm firing off phrases of where to be on the floor, that's clear to where I'm speaking to. One area that a lot of coaches don't use that, that I don't know if I came up with it or whether I got a lot of basketball, they say is stolen from other coaches and there's nothing original. But I call that area above the free throw line here, between the free throw line and the, and the top of the key, I call that the pocket, get to the pocket, all right? Where you're not one foot in the lane and getting a cheap three second call, but you're at the elbow, but you're in, in the pocket. So I'll speak to you a little bit about protecting the ball and the dribble. Simple exercise to do that or just the crab dribble, all right? Just to have that ball dribble in between your feet, low stance, just protecting the ball. Simple crab dribble, all right? Crab dribble, crab dribble. Same thing, if you have the defender on this side, then you might protect and turn this way, okay? Head on swivel, knowing where you are on the floor offensively. If you're over somewhere and you know there's a defender and a teammate over here, you have to be aware of that, all right? You have to have that sense, remembering where players are when your head is turned to your teammate or a defender, all right? So dribbling is one of those areas where the emulation of the NBA is detrimental at the lower levels. The high school game should be, in my opinion, more reflective of college than of the NBA. There are things that are allowed that are not called in the NBA that in high school are called, should be called. All right? One of them is, is dribbling and carry. Right? So I'll let the referees that will be in this presentation of this, this clinic collection for this year speak to that, but when a player puts his hand under the ball and continues to dribble, that should be called in my opinion. It's taken away the, the headiness, the, the smart defender's advantage to defend when a player can put his hand under the ball and keep his dribble. Now, to my understanding, that it has to be kind of a step before it's called, but like I said, 35 years ago and 35 pounds ago, I was fairly quick and I was good at getting up into the offensive player and recognizing when a player was going to pick up the ball to shoot. So if I saw if I saw this in any way, shape, or form, I was up into that catch, right, as a defender, where I could prevent an easy pickup and shot. Right, but now sometimes kids are kids get away with with with, with carries, right? And dribble and traveling is another one. They try to copy that the euro step and the step back for the shot, which I think has caused a little downside in the performance of shooting. And don't get me wrong, there are a lot of kids at the younger levels that can shoot lights out, plain and simple, and. But now in the last two, three, you know, even as far back as four or five years, this step back thing is starting to become very popular. Some kids can do it, some kids cannot. But if you practice it, then you can get better at it. But some kids just think they can come in the gym, do this, and get the same result as a regular shot. That's not always the case. The shot ends up being flatter, it doesn't have the same arc, okay? And you're more likely to have a greater chance to get called for a travel. And you also have a more chance of getting stuck in a position that you can't make the pass 
and you pick up your dribble and you're out of position and you get smothered by the defender and ultimately can lead to a turnover. Individual play workouts to get better. Just throwing the ball off yourself, working on, on your pivots and then your, your movements after the catch. Your jab step short, jab long, okay, protecting the ball, rip throughs, dribble, protecting the ball, head on a swivel so you see your teammates, being aware of where the defenders are, visualizing defenders on the angles and positionings that they are within the spacing, and then where your teammates might be and how you would create an angle to make a good pass. You're not always going to have this pass. You're not always going to have this pass. You might have to step and wrap around a bounce pass, okay? And to be able to do that to your strong hand and to your weak hand, those are the things that you can improve in the off season. So having a schedule and, and writing out your practice plan is so important to do to keep track of what you've done and what you want to do um, as, as the season goes on. But other coaches will, will speak to that in some of the presentations that, that, that you'll see here in, in this collection. So it's, it's kind of an online clinic uh, of different topics for this year to uh, kind of in place of our in-person uh, clinic um, that the BBCA hosts every year.